Hello and welcome to another comedian's interview for my blog and podcast, A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 1,000 comedians and counting for nearly 50 years. My guest today is the wonderful comedian, it's Alexandra Haddo. Yeah! <laughs> Thank you so much for Hello. having me. That is the... <laughs> That's a nicer reception than some gigs. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? You all right? I'm good, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. It's lovely to see you, and thank you so much. Um, uh, the the interview is going to be about 45 minutes to an hour, and we're going to go right back right. to the start. And if you, can, if you can tell me, please, how did you become a comedian in the first place? Um, I love telling this story, actually. It was um, it was through a friend of mine who was a comedian. He was a stand-up comedian. He's now a writer for a lot of TV shows. His name is James Farmer. He's brilliant. Um, and I was just, just pals with him. Yeah? We used to kind of, you know, bounce script ideas off each other, but I didn't work in comedy or anything like that. And he said, oh, you should, you know, you should do stand-up. And I was like, absolutely not, you know, because I, I was such a huge stand-up fan that, you know, if when you're that in awe of something... And you've, yeah. you know, you've not got any background in it whatsoever. I mean, I did like a bit of performing arts when I was a kid, but I'm not from like a performance background, you know. Um, he said, you should do it. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, I couldn't think of anything more nerve wracking and stuff. And um, he said, well, let's t- I tell you what, why don't you write me five minutes of, you know, what you would say if you were going to do a gig? And I thought, well, that's quite a fun exercise, you know. Um, so I did that and then I gave it to him and he said, this is great uh and it's a good job that it is because i've booked you on to do a spot tomorrow night at the cavendish arms <laughs> wow yeah so he Brilliant. tricked me yeah um <laughs> he tri- he tricked me my friend tricked me into what's now my life's passion and job um Brilliant. so yeah so i, I did i did my first gig uh and i didn't tell any anyone i was doing it i didn't tell anyone apart from my best friend and James, obviously, because he was he was the one that sort of organised it, and they came with me, and I did it, and I had quite a good, you know, first for a first gig, it wasn't like a horror story at all. Um, <laughs> it was amazing, you know, and I had such a buzz, and I called my dad and told him that I did it on the way home, stuff like that. Oh, brilliant! And then I know it was it was amazing. Honestly, it was it was great. But the weird thing is, then the next week I was going to go back and do it again. And, you know, when you start out, you need a bringer and there's quite a lot of bringer gigs where you have to bring someone to a gig to kind of make the audience, you know, pack out a bit. Um, And James wasn't free that night. And um, I went to the Cavendish Arms and I remember being sat there. I mean, not only did they do the, uh, they are quite strict with, you know, you have to bring somebody. I'm sure I could have asked somebody else, but I didn't have the confidence at the time to do it in front of anybody else um, after one gig. And so I didn't do it again. I didn't gig again for about two years. Wow. Uh, yeah, I just sort of thought, oh, I've, you know, I've ticked that off. That's that's nice kind of thing. So so, um, so when was the first gig? What, the what very first gig. The, the very first gig was probably 2014, I think. Right. So, um, so, so it took you till 2016 to go again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it was 20... Yeah, it must be 2014. I'm just trying to work it out now. Yeah, I think that was that's right. And I think I, I think I did one in those two years, you know. And then I went away. My my granddad passed away, and I got a like a oh, couple dear, of grand, I'm basically. Sorry. Um, it's fine. I mean, it's he was he was very old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I got a couple of grand of you know when he passed away, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go away on my own for like two months. And I did the sort of classic sort of cliche. I've never had a chance to you know go traveling or anything like that. And I went away for two months and I just realised that I was quite, not bored in my job, but I knew that it wasn't, you know, what I wanted to do. And I kind of didn't really know what to do. And and by the end of it, I was like, you know what? And I met a really nice group of people out there and I told them that I'd done a couple of stand-up gigs before and they were like, you should do it, you know. And I, I worked in this restaurant and they were always saying, you know, you should give it a go and stuff like that. So I came back and I just, I remember writing in my diary um you know like try and do three gigs a month and yeah. now you know I mean I'm gigging later tonight like it's it's always you know what I mean it's I gig three times in a night sometimes now it's mad that's brilliant um, that's, that's so, yeah, so, cool. so 
Yeah, so then, so then I came I came back, did a gig, and then just just from then on, like sort of just. So I I still say I've only been going like five and a half years. Maybe it was twenty seventeen. So, I don't know, whichever one it was. But um, yeah. yeah. So since then, I've just been yeah hammering it basically. Well, you get addicted, don't you? So I I know the Cavendish Arms very well. I used I used to know the resident compare Brendan O'Donoghue, who's been on. This oh yeah, yeah. Known really yeah. well. Very funny man. Um, oh, he's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, very funny. And uh, I, I, I used to go there, and I used to go to Birdies on the. Yes, Strand, I did that. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Bird, and then, and then, uh, um, uh, Brendan was the resident MC, and I would be that five minute friend. So, so I would go a oh, lot, brilliant. got a lot of comedians with the laugh. <laughs> yeah also, do you know what honestly you're you're a lifesaver for for people starting out you know because it's so nice of people to give up their time to come along oh, with I us especially when you're starting out you know um yeah the way you, you might not be necessarily uh great but it's um it's yeah it's great I loved I love that my friends were actually quite supportive when I started I was I was always I was always okay for bringers which was which so nice of them you know that's great. And then I, I think the key is to kind of befriend, befriend someone that, that runs a bringer gig so that you, sometimes you can get away with not bringing one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I, it's very kind of you to say because that's a reason why the blog exists. I, I don't only support established acts, I support up and coming acts of as course, well. Of course, yeah. Having, having seen so many over the years, I've become very astute at um what i believe is a very good lineup of comedy acts so so if you yeah. want to go to the comedy store or something like that i i believe i could pick a very good oh, list because i've seen so many of them but but some of the up and coming ones one of the one of the other great things about the blog is watching the comedians develop um yeah I've, I first saw Harry Hill, for example, 30 years ago, just as he was starting no way. downstairs at the King's Head. And he's just one example of many. And uh, he he ran onto the stage. He was late for the show. He brushed yeah. his knee, stood up onto the stage and went, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry I'm late. I had to have a testicle brought down. And that got a laugh. And then he said, from Derby. And to... <laughs> And to this day, it's the best opening line I've ever heard. And when I met him 30 years later, he went, oh, yeah, Rich. He said, I still tell that in my routine. <laughs> That's amazing. I That's love fantastic. that. Fantastic. And, and of yeah. course, the memories of watching them all as well. It's so, so good. Um, yeah. Did you, did you ever find it difficult at all um, breaking through into comedy? Did you ever have difficulty getting gigs or anything like that? I feel like I didn't like when I I mean I remember the days of you know emailing everybody and uh, uh, that sort of thing but I was quite lucky that I I used to I did the Boogaloo as one of my first ones big nose yeah. comedy David Lewis running it who's still a, a good friend he's a guy and um I went there and I sort of got on with David really well straight away and I kind of always, almost always had a spot there every Thursday. And to have almost like a guaranteed weekly gig early on doesn't sound like a lot now because I gig so much, but it was nice to kind of always have that spot. You know, even if I managed to get one other that week, you're starting out, you've got two a week, you know, that kind of thing. Um, And then, you know, I remember Matt Hutchinson, who was also kind of doing Big Nose, uh, asked me to do like a spot on his compilation show at the Fringe, and I was just like, I honestly, I felt like I was, you know, Mickey Flanagan opening oh. Wembley Arena or something. Like, I was like, I can't believe I'm going to be on at the Fringe, you know, like <laughs> as if it was like my own show. But um, good for and you. Do you know what? My first, my first ever spot at the Fringe was that, and I and I got the time wrong by an hour, and I had to yeah. leg it. And I honestly, I legged it in legged it into the, the the venue as he was saying please welcome to the stage Alexandra Haddo wow. and I got on there I know and I think that was my first ever death I mean full-on stage yeah. death like they yeah I think just I wasn't you know I wasn't prepared because I was panicking about the the time yeah yeah 
so yeah lesson learned always double check your gigs <laughs> I've always I've always said to a lot of the comedians, and there's been a lot on the on 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 the podcast. I I, yeah. I would guess it's all about experience. I think I think in order to have a bad gig, it it makes you a better comedian. Would you Would you agree? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's definitely scope for um for both types of gig, definitely because you know I play the Bill Murray a lot in London, which is yeah. my my favorite place play yeah. it's um you know i mean now i'm saying this touch wood I've, i'm saying i've never had a bad gig there you know i always feel electric on stage there um but and people and people say oh it's not you know it's not very it's not really teaching you much though and you think i do actually enjoy this job you know like you're allowed to have both but it is true you're right like that then you go to the gigs i often find outside london is is a big learning curve that everybody should do and i think that that's what you're talking about that's quite interesting you know you can yeah. take your jokes to you know the middle of Yorkshire or something and people will be like what and it, that kind of teaches you how to adapt on yeah. stage or how to yeah. adapt to material or how to write for a wider audience so then you can sort of pick and choose as you go along um but yeah I do think difficult gigs are essential because otherwise yeah you're never really going to improve because you're never going to question yourself at a good gig you know yeah I I I would never, I, I can never imagine you having a bad gig because you're always so enthusiastic when I saw you on stage. And so as soon as you go on stage, you, you, you've yeah. got the audience and you can say what you like. And that's half of it because you're very endearing on stage. Would you agree? Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I am a lot. And I think that's a great yeah. skill to have as well. I think that, that improves you as a comedian and... Uh, yeah, I've not had many, you know, full on deaths. Um, and I find that as an MC, it's diff more difficult to die. Not that you're trying to, but like you can always kind of bring it. I'm quite good at chatting to people, you know, like even yeah. in a difficult game, whereas doing a set at a tough gig, I find way tougher, you know, because mm -hmm. you're if the MC's already done quite a lot of crowd work, you can't really go into that. And anyway, you don't want you you, you kind of want to work through your set. You kind of want to get them um but yeah no I have had tough gigs but yeah I am I'm very upbeat so it's um I don't let it get me down really no no um, never never keep going keep going yeah. that's the key to it yeah um, it's interesting because my home city is Carlisle uh all oh, right yeah but but I've been working living and working in London for half my life 30 years but yeah. I go I go back to Carlisle I've still got uh, lots of friends up there and certainly over the years, um, uh, the comedy scene in Carlisle has grown. They've got they've got yeah. the Open station. They've got the Sand Centre. So lots of up and coming comedians tend to play yeah. there. But it is true what you say about t testing a joke in different parts of the country because um, yeah, yeah. I, do, I do go and see acts there as well as here, and you can tell that the audio you can tell the different yeah. audiences. You know, it's it's, it's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird you it's, say Carlisle as well because I was I was talking to a woman this weekend. I was at Shine On Festival. At oh the yeah, comedy tent. Um, and this woman was saying she saw. I won't name the acts because it's. She was talking about how he didn't do well in Carlisle, but she said that she saw him at the Fringe and he was a brilliant and amazing and smashed it. And then she booked tickets for him in Carlisle. And she said she still really enjoyed him, but it was interesting the different audience because he just bombed for like the whole hour. That's, that's and amazing. She said it was, I felt so bad for him, you know. That that's but amazing. Again, it's, the, yeah. it's, the, it's the famous um, Ken Dodd story where he talks about the history of laughter, and he uses Freud as an example, and and he he, he goes into this elongated line about how laughter works and everything and freud said yeah. this and freud did that mind you ladies and gentlemen freud didn't play the glasgow empire on a friday night <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah exactly <laughs> so there, there he is completely right yeah. <laughs> so so it's fascinating it's fascinating um what do you like to talk about on stage do you have any specific themes or anything like that do you know what? For a few, you know, for the first sort of few years of my um, career, and up until fairly recently, I've always done stuff that is based in truth. You know, I'm talking about something that's happened to me in a relationship or in a 
friendship or in my life and then you know then you're kind of expanding on it or you're going into a bit or you're doing an axe out or something like that but recently I've tried to do a little bit more sort of political stuff and stuff about class and stuff like that just because just to make it more interesting for me and more interesting for the audiences and like you say if an audience isn't going for something if you've only got that you know it's difficult to sort of guide them somewhere else and see if you can get them so um I'm trying to kind of expand on what I talk about now but I find it difficult to write about more abstract stuff in a stand-up setting like I I'm on Twitter quite a lot and all of my stuff there is is a lot more political, is a lot more kind of, um, you know, <laughs> I I mean, I'm not alone in hating the government, but, you know, I, I'm quite into politics. I keep up with you it, some of that. Help. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, exactly, yeah. And it's, I've, I've, done a, I've done a bit of political stuff recently and it, it goes down well, but I feel like there is that sense that, you know, people have come to a comedy show to kind of, like, shut their mind off from that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you can't I do think I can do too much of it because it becomes even if it's funny I think they people kind of think oh I don't want to think you know because it, things are so dire at the moment it's um it's almost like unless you're unless you've got an absolute banger of an angle or a joke you know <laughs> people kind of want it people kind of want to hear about a funny sex story instead you know they want to like yeah. take their mind <laughs> you know <laughs> like so so yeah, so I'm trying to write about different about different stuff now. But yeah, I I'm I lo- I'm fascinated by like by relationships and dating and and it's it, you know it's a lot of people talk about it, but it, because it's interesting, you yeah, know, because yeah, exactly. it's like very much so, sort of yeah. a mystery, yeah, all the time. But um, yeah. I think I yeah I love I love talking about that. I do I think it's great. Uh, and and following on from that, how do you remember all your routines? Do you write things down? Do you have a notebook? Do you write things down on your hand? Yeah, I, I when I'm first writing out ideas, I I have to write them out by hand. I never type them because um, I find it, it goes in easier if I've written them, and yeah. I write it out as like exactly as I would say it the first time, um, which I think is probably a bad thing because you probably stick to that a bit too much when you're starting when you're doing new material. <laughs> um, but yeah, I write it out in my hand. I sort of test it out. You know, I'm doing a new material night later tonight, you know, that sort of thing. And um, and then whenever I do new material, not only am I, is, are the jokes double the length they need to be, for one thing, um, because you're sort of padding it out with, the, with you know, your apologetic language to people like, sorry, I'm just trying this out, just trying this out. <laughs> and I'm so bad at it. I'm so bad at uh, the first no. time I say it stage it's so nerve-wracking even now you know you've been going for years and you think this is quite a good idea and then you think is it you know (laughs) (laughs) I Um, um, I, yeah uh, the 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 reason why I asked the question is is that um uh, the uh most creative thing I've done other than this blog you see the poster right behind me uh, I I wrote a play for comic relief oh wow uh, called the applicant, which featured me and my friend. My friend does is very good at accents, and uh, it was all about me. And uh, it was it was basically about uh, um, I was uh, I had a successful girlfriend in London, and uh, I was coming down to London from Carlisle, and I never had a job. I'd never had an interview in my life. So each scene was me going for a different job. So oh, I would, amazing! Yeah. I would write, I would write a monologue and then the interview and a monologue and the interview. My friend paid all the in, all, all the interviewees, and it was just it was just yeah. magical. By the end of it, um, there is a lot of plot, but by the end of it, it is a comedy. Um, but I get my I get my ideal job. I get given my ideal job, and then the interviewer kills me. <laughs> no. So the, so, the, so the next scene is me at the gates of heaven or hell. Um, uh, being interviewed by God, deciding whether or not I should interview corpses for the Nile. Oh you, my God, that's you know, brilliant! Shrugged my shoulders, and that was it. So there I was. Oh, I'd, I I'd written all. I'd written all this stuff, and um, uh, um, we rehearsed it and rehearsed it. And the first night we did it, we did one of three shows. First night we did yeah. it, I ran out and I completely forgot my monologue that I'd written. I was like a rabbit in headlights. I was good. Oh no! And and um and what was interesting was 
as soon as a prop came on or my friend came on, I never missed a beat again. And I got all the laps and everything. Yeah. The next two yeah. shows were perfect. And, and, yeah. and originally I wrote it for the Edinburgh Fringe, who knows? But, um, you know, never say never. But um, uh, it was fascinating. Um, and that's why I asked the question, because how do you remember it all as, as you're going along? Do you have things, in, pointers in your head? Um, it, it is like muscle memory for me. And I'm quite lucky in that I've always been quite good at, at remem- genuinely, at just sort of like remembering yeah. things. And um, sometimes I write a, a word on my, if it's a new bit, you know, if there's like a few bits to a new bit. Um, but I'm trying to phase that out for sort of big gigs. You know, when you're doing a longer set, sometimes it's almost like a placebo. It's like a sort of, um, I'll just write the, a, you know, a keyword on my hand. But it's so funny because if, if if somebody doesn't know you've just done a comedy gig and you're on the tube home or something and you've got like tits, blowjob, <laughs> you know, Corbin written on your hands. Oh. <laughs> People are like, what's going on? You know, like. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've, um, I, I've, I've, I've never really had a problem with that. I'm, I've yeah. just realised that I'm quite lucky to have that really. It's um, when I'm starting out, I, I, I do forget, but I sort of muddle through and then I sort of structure the idea more. Do you know what I mean? And then I think, sure. okay, yeah. 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 I think and I get I more think, confident. Yeah. I, I, th- I think again, it's just all about experience. The more you do, the better yeah. you get at it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What's your view of comedy competitions? Do you think they're a good thing? Do you think they help a comic's career? That is a very good question. Um, and one I've never been asked before. <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I generally haven't. I haven't. Um I it's so interesting because I think they are really helpful for people who are good in that medium. Yeah. Um I think there's absolutely a place for them because I think sometimes if you're, you know, if you don't live in London and you can't gig all the time or a, you know or a big city, it can sometimes sort of get you on people's radar quicker than it would do, you know, if you're emailing for spots all the time or if you're trying to break into something and I think it's definitely it's it's great for that. I've always been rubbish at them, at terrible. Um, I was going to say you've done many of them. Yeah, mm. I did. Um, I I've done. I did Leicester Square New Act a few, two times or three times, um, and I got through to like the next round once. Uh, and I did Funny Women one year and got through to the next round and then out. Uh, and I think well done. That's it. Um, but I just I've never I've never um, been that bothered about them and yeah. I've never done well in them. So I do think it's a certain but like my friend Hubert Meyer, who I think, you know, as well, Austrian comedian, much fantastic so. comedian. Um, he's brilliant at them. He can he's because his stuff is um, quite different. He's so very dark, you know, he can kind of stand out, I think. And his jokes are some of them are like longer bits, but a lot of them he can he can fit it into that short sort of competition window. If you know what yeah. I mean? Um, whereas I was always, because um, I've always, mine's sort of more storytelling. I was always so nervous about the time in a, co- in a competition that I don't think I was ever as relaxed as I was in a normal gig. So it's sort of catch 22 <laughs> and then I never really got through. And, and it was just, yeah, but he's, he's brilliant. You know, I know people that they can seemingly sort of not really put a foot wrong, you know, with competitions. Yeah. And I just, I never did, but um, my housemate, Rich Spalding, actually, he, um, another great comedian. I don't know if you know him. He is, yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And he, um, he just, you know, got the, the, uh, the critics award in the final of the, you know, the Beat the Frog World Series. Yeah, 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 yeah. I read that, yeah. You know. well, well done him. Yeah. And that's what I mean. And, and I think that's great because, you know, he's now got loads of paid spots in a club that perhaps he wouldn't have got booked in before. So I think it's, yeah. it's, it's a good way to get yourself on people's radar and to kind of hone your timing, I think, as well, because it's so kind of constrained and it's quite quick. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's definitely a skill, but it's one that I do not possess. <laughs> um, do you suffer from any nerves before you go on stage and how do you cope with them if you do? 
Um, I do sometimes. It depends on the gig. Yeah. And it's not always necessarily the size of the gig either. It's quite weird. It's. I think it's <laughs> if it's a gig where I'm on with, you know, a lot bigger acts, I get, I get nervous. Or um, if the crowd seems not even intimidating, because I sort of see that as a challenge. But like sometimes if a crowd seems difficult and you're worried that you you don't know how, you don't know how they're going to go for you i get nervous or um like yesterday i was doing a massive gig at shine on festival and the room was huge i mean we got in there and we thought jesus this is it was like an aircraft hangar you know <laughs> and that's probably like yeah it was mad it was mental i thought it was going to be like in a little pub um and there was like 1500 seats and i thought oh wow. god you know if only if only 200 people come to this which is still a great number it's going to look empty, you know. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there was like a thousand people in there by the time I went on, and I was, I was nervous for that because it's a situation where you don't know how it's going to go down. You know, it's a festival; people aren't there for comedy necessarily. But so many people were kind of. It was day three of the festival. They'd watched a lot of bands. They wanted, you know, a bit of a bit of a change, um, and. Uh, and it was great. Like I, I don't generally. As soon as I get the ser- first laugh, I'm not nervous anymore. Yeah. So, and I, was, I always I try and say to myself. I yeah. Was just, I was just going to say, um, do you agree that as soon as you speak into the microphone, the nerves go? So actually, yeah, they they def- they lessen as soon as you speak, yeah. and then as soon as I get the first laugh, I'm a- I'm absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, what's what's yeah, uh, so- What's what's infamous, and I've told a lot of comedians this story as well, is um, I, yeah. I I once had a go at stand-up comedy myself. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, because because I remembered all the jokes that the comedians would tell would, would make me laugh. I thought I'll give this a go and 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 see what it's like. And it, and and I, yeah. I I was very nervous, and I and I went uh, to uh, I know a promoter who who years ago he used, he used to put on gong shows and he had, yeah. he had he had a gong show for old people and uh i wrote this script out about me being very accident prone in carlisle driving cars and he loved it and he said right he said you've got three minutes to go and entertain these people it was a wet monday afternoon it couldn't be worse and i walked oh, out i was <laughs> I walked out. There's three people in the audience. I walked out, and the first thing I said was, um, "Good afternoon, everybody." People think I look like Eddie the Eagle Edwards, the ski jumper, but I can't see the resemblance myself. And of course, I'm this double. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One old bloke at the back just went, "Fuck off!" and got me off. <laughs> and I walked off to my own footsteps. And I said to the promoter, he said, have another go. I said, I don't know. I said, I said, I think my calling is sitting in the audience supporting all the people who can do this well. Oh, that's, <laughs> never, that's never a shame, say though. Never again. <laughs> yeah. But, but the Fuck nerves. that guy. The, back of <laughs> the nerves, thank you. The, the nerves were palpable that day. And, and uh, I do feel sorry when you have to walk out and yeah. hopefully you're walking out to a, round, a massive round of applause because people are there and want yeah. to see you. But as soon as you speak, if you're good at it like you are, um, uh, it all goes away. The I think half of the half of the nerves is sort of it's your nerves, and then the audience are nervous. And if then if you're if you don't show your nervous, they relax, you relax, and then the gig's great. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's almost yeah. like a little standoff, really, like mentally yeah. at the start of a gig. Yeah. Very um, much, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally yeah, agree yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's weird. You were you were extremely impressive when I saw you recently at Twenty One Solo. You were, oh, you, thank you. you were absolutely hilarious. You did a brilliant 20 minute routine. Please, can you describe your writing process if you've got one? And where do you get your ideas from for a routine or a show? Um, it's usually, like I say, usually, you know, something's happened to me. And it's even if it's usually the funnier it is at the time, the difficult, more difficult it is to sort of make into a routine. 
Um, but it's usually, you know, I'm retelling the story at, you know, at the pub or to my friends or something like that. And I'll, I will add things in as I'm telling it just because, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I mean, I'm a good storyteller, right? So I'm yeah. telling them that. And often then as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, that's a good idea. Do you know what I mean? Like as I'm saying it, and then it's <laughs> right, like a trigger note in my phone. Um, there was one I just said to my friend and it became a, a one, well, it became a bit of a bigger bit, but it still works as a one liner um, that I said to my friend, you know, um, once I went, I changed the sort of setting and stuff like that. But once when I was, um, my dad had to come down to London, you know, last minute or something and uh, couldn't get a hotel or whatever. And so <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't have a sofa at the time. My, my friend, we, at the time we, my friend was sort of staying in the living room, uh, like between houses. And so my dad was like, well, we'll just have to share a bed. And my mate was like, oh, that's a bit weird, isn't it? And I sort of was <laughs> telling this. I was retelling this to my friend and I went, what's the insinuation is I'm going to sleep with my own dad if I share the bed, like as if that's what's been holding me back. Like, do you know what I mean? And then that's, and then that became a whole bit because that is quite, that is a thing. Yeah. You know, people that it's, it's the absurdity. It's like thinking about what they actually meet, what they're actually insinuating by that. And it's like, of course, it's not ideal to be sharing a bed with my dad, you know, when I'm 30 something, but it's also under very specific circumstances where there wasn't, do you know what I mean? There wasn't another yes, option does. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Where, and it's that's how that's how the idea came about. Yeah, exactly. And then I sort of wrote around that um, and sort of built up why it had to happen, and then put a few yeah. jokes in the in the build. And then, yeah, that's that's kind of how I do it. And then sometimes I sort of sit down. I need to like I need I have to book a show in because I need a deadline to write to. So what I do is I book a show in, or you know, split hour or something like that. And then it makes me sit down and think, right. And it might be fruitless, you know, when I do, when I sit down uh, on purpose to write, sometimes I look at two pages of notes and I think, I've got maybe one joke in that. But that's, that's, <laughs> you know, of that's what, yeah. that's what it is, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, and often sort of our st routine will start quite small and, you know, and then you'll sort of add to it. Like a lot of my ideas do start off as kind of, <laughs> sort of polarized really either a, either a story that's sort of amusing but not really quite funny enough yet or like a really funny one-liner that needs like a bit of a story around it so that I have to eventually bring them into the middle and uh yeah that's that's how it works so do you do you, it's, it's you do you do Sorry? you wake do you wake up in the middle of the night and with with a bright idea and then have to write it down or you know what? I wish I did because that always sounds really cool when people say that. <laughs> I think, you know, like I had to write it down or whatever. And but no, I never do that. Do you know why? Because I am the best sleeper on planet Earth. I am like, even if I've had a stressful day or I'm anxious or whatever, I am like, you will sleep. Head hit the pillow. Yeah. God. That's yeah. amazing. Um, um, which is, which is, yeah, it, which I realize is uh, a gift as I, the more I get older. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah, certainly, certainly for me, I'm 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 55 this year. Yeah. It's hard to They're all laughter lines, and I need my. <laughs> <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's 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 move on. Um, I'm I'm very lucky every year to be able to go to the Edinburgh Fringe. That's my holiday. Yeah, uh, and I go for a week. And I see about fifty shows, and I'm exhausted. By oh, amazing! Come back, but all my friends join me. It's the best experience going. What was your first uh, Edinburgh Fringe like? What What year was it? What were you doing? Um, the first time I went was was around 2016, I think. Um, mm. I didn't go until then, just because I, you know, I hadn't had the money, or I was working, or whatever. And I used to go to a lot of comedy shows here, you know, and I didn't really know as much about it as I should. I knew what it was and everything, but I just sort of, I don't know why it never crossed my mind to go earlier, but I went up yeah. with some friends yeah. um, and we had a great time. And then we we started going, we went for like the next two or three years. And then I think the third year was when I was doing that aforementioned terrible spot that uh, <laughs> from my <laughs> Ran in, um, and then I went up. Yeah. <laughs> you were there, Rich. 
um yeah it just kind of like grew incrementally really from that I just couldn't believe like the first time I went I just couldn't believe how amazing it was you know I was the same as you I was seeing like shows a day and the whole city is just sort of sparkling you know and it's um for a comedy lover oh it's just it was just absolutely brilliant like we saw so much stuff and we saw so many people like you say that are now huge and we saw them in tiny venues and you know it was great yeah. Um, I just it is, it. I was like, oh my god, I'm... yeah. There's something, there's something very special about it. As soon as you step off the train at Waverley, the atmosphere just hits you, and you, and yeah. you, and you have this yeah. amazing experience for a week or so. It's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. It's I'm very, very lucky. Um, when you did your first gigs there, did you have you built them up? Have you done like? There's two or three of you doing an hour, or you've or you've done forty five minutes, or yeah, anything. yeah, yeah. So I did, I did, um, yeah, I did like one spot that year. Then I did, I went up the next next year and did a few spots, you know, just on compilation shows. Then the yeah. following year, twenty nineteen, I did a split bill with Rich Spalding, brilliant, um, called called Sex Question Mark, which you can sort of see the poster of there next to my sorry about. <laughs> about the pile of yeah 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 yeah. we did a split bill called question mark which we we wanted to do a split bill but with a bit of a concept and a thread running through it's just so it wasn't like here's half an hour of me and here's half an hour of him you know (laughs) so we were um we were platonic friends at the time we still are but that that's content that is relevant um, we were platonic friends at the time and we thought what if we did because our lot of our, our stuff was about relationships and sex and dating and stuff I said well why don't we do you know a show where the sort of the gimmick is we'll make the case for each of our sort of sexual pasts in the show and then at the end the audience can vote whether we should sleep with each other or not wow <laughs> That that so is we had, <laughs> yeah yeah so we so we did like a sort of bit together on stage at the top that was sort of like loosely scripted every day. Then we did our our sort of set pieces, and then we came on at the end, and the audience had cue cards on their seats, and they had to vote bone or home. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, what a good idea. And now, <laughs> yeah, and now, Rich, I live with Rich and his girlfriend because he met and fell in love with my housemate so it was it was quite funny because then we did, <laughs> we did and then, yeah i know and then of course the, the pandemic hit and so yeah, we didn't yeah, do anything in 2020 and but then 2021 we did a couple of shows at camden fringe we did wedding question mark which was kind of a, a follow-on um and yeah. it was but it wasn't like should we marry each other because by that time he was with jess and i had been with someone else and we did a sort of a show just about marriage and weddings and that sort of um stage of life which was a lot of fun and uh and then this year at edinburgh i did a 45 my first ever solo 45 minute show and then next well year well done you yeah. well done you yeah. how, how 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 successful was that was it good it was it was great i had honestly i had such a good run i did free fringe and i did two weeks which i think was was sort of perfect it was it was long enough to the, that it made me a better comedian, but it was no. short enough that I didn't lose my mind. I think, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how. Uh, you, I don't know. I mean, twenty nights is is long enough, but the yeah. twenty, the full twenty five. That's that's extraordinary. It's and insanity, it's, and and I don't think actually beneficial those last five. You know, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, almost like even if you did the full run but you like you don't do Sundays or something I think that's probably quite healthy for people are you, um, are, you are you going up again in 2023 I think I'm gonna do do my hour yeah I've I've got an idea and uh not my well, finest hour I do it about all the bad things I've done in my life uh well but, well done you and I will and I will definitely come and see you this year oh yeah, please do thank Definitely. you so much yes yeah. yeah yeah i'm so pleased you're going back up there because uh we're going to be busily um organizing it all at the start of the new year um, yeah to date what's been your comedy highlight have you got one? Oh, that's a great question i uh did a show um in this summer 
in, at Ealing Comedy Festival um, in a big outdoor tent. It was a huge, one of the biggest crowds I've ever played to. Um, probably like 700 to 800 people. Wow. Uh, and it was myself, uh, Neil Delamere. I was comparing. Yeah. He's um, brilliant. Neil Dino. Delamere. Yeah, he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah. Justin Morehouse, who was great. Oh, he's one of my favourites. He's been. <laughs> I know. He's so good. Yeah. He and such yeah. a lovely guy as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's yeah. He's one of the nicest people you could meet. Yeah. yeah. And the and the the headliner was my sort of comedy hero, um, Dylan Moran. Oh so, wow! What um, a bill. There's not a bad I know. A bad act on that bill, including you. <laughs> oh, like, honestly, Richard, I could not believe. Do you know what? And I and I snaked my way into that job. I tell you why. Wow. Um, I, I was doing headliners in uh, in Chiswick. Yeah. And no Simon, who's motor, lovely Simon, um, yeah. was uh, I was there, you know, and he was, and I was emceeing for him, and he was chatting away, and he said, "Oh, we've just to his friend." <laughs> And I and he said, "Oh, we've just got Dylan Morin for the Ealing Comedy Festival." And I went, oh, "What? Oh my god, really?" And, and you know, interjecting basically. And he said, "Yeah, yeah." And I said, "Oh my god, he's my absolute favourite." And he said, "Oh well, we're, <laughs> we haven't got any room on that on that bill." And I went, "Oh no, no, I wasn't." Which I genuinely wasn't. I was like, I wasn't hinting to, uh, you know, to to do it. I was just thinking I'll come and watch because I didn't know he was gigging again at the moment. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the next week he calls me up and he said, look, do you do you want to MC it? And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. How cool is so, that? That must yeah. have been amazing. It was amazing. Like, And, you know, he was really lovely. And uh, I, I had a great gig as well. You know, like often those big crowds in a big festival like this weekend and stuff, you know, you it can be touch and go because it doesn't feel very intimate or... Yeah, it's tough, I have, it, I have it, been it, it, many times and yeah. noticed that. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah. You know, like, there are some, doing some, a set, it's a bit easier. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. crowd work sometimes because you're so far from them and, you know, they don't feel, you know, as close or whatever. It can be difficult, but I had a, a blinder of a gig and I, um, yeah, and I got to meet Dylan Moran and I intro mm. introduced him onto the stage, you know, and I just, I was so, I was so buzzing, you know. That's fantastic. How, how cool is the, that? You know, the annoying thing is as well is that like Simon, bless him, like I didn't want to ask Dylan for a photo because I just didn't, you know, he was in his own sort of headspace <laughs> and all this. And so Simon said, oh, I need to get a photo of all the acts. And wow. I knew what he was doing. He was just doing it like for me, I think. Um, but I said my friend Roddy was in the crowd that night. And, um, and I said, oh, when I bring Dylan on, you know, when mm. I shake his hand, Will you get a photo of me on stage with Dylan? You know, and uh, and Steve Best was there as well, amazing photographer, and I got some great shots and stuff. And uh, and Roddy was like, "Yep." And I was texting him, you know, backstage. He was like, "I'm poised and ready, poised and ready with my camera." And I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe I'm introducing this man to the stage. You know, he's a comedy hero of mine. He's got, if he's not one of yours already, he will be by tonight." Mister, please welcome Mister Dylan Moran. And I walked off stage and he and he was nowhere to be seen. He'd got lost. <laughs> no. <laughs> and gone oh, in the no. wrong, wrong entrance. And so and then he sort of ran on and got a laugh because it was quite funny. But I didn't get like the handshake shot of him. So um, um when he when he came off, um I got sort of what like Roddy managed to get one where we were both on stage at the same time. So that I'll take that. That'll that, that's enough for me. <laughs> it, 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 um, it, it reminds me of the Ealing comedy story. Um, uh, I, I was probably the last person to interview on this blog, uh, on this podcast, Barry Cryer. And he was just the, oh, nicest person, the nicest person. And he was emceeing the Ealing Comedy Festival a couple of years ago. And headlining, yeah. headlining on the night was Alan Davis. And he, yeah. and he and he accidentally introduced him to close the first half instead of the second half, and you could see the banter between the two of them when he knew oh, no. they, they just joked it yeah. away 
it, it was just the nicest thing to see. And so, and so you're oh, sorry, yeah. I feel sorry for you that he wasn't there, but he then came in and it was great. <laughs> yeah, but hey, that's more of a story. That's what we live yeah, for yeah. as comedians. You know? <laughs> but but one, wonderful stuff. Um, who are your who are your favourite comedians, past and present? Did did you have comedy growing up in the house or anything like this? Yeah, yeah. Um, Billy Connolly growing up. My dad's Scottish, so um, wow. Billy Connolly was everywhere. I remember when I broke up with my first boyfriend, you know, when I was like 15, 16, I remember coming into the living room and I was, you know, I was in tears and stuff and my dad cheered me up and then we put on a Billy Connolly VHS. Um, um, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Um, is, yeah, is, I always, always grew up is, with, yeah. Is in oh, continent, God, I... Is incontinent sketch on the Billy and Albert uh, video. Oh. Still one of the Ridiculous. funniest things ever. Yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Well, and I still know. quote it. You yeah, know, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Um, I saw him, I saw him twice live. He was he, he he was extraordinary. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I, I, saw absolutely, him I absolutely love him. Before. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Who who else? Coffee. Uh, well, Dylan Moran, as I say, I remember watching. You know, just sat with my dad one night watching TV, and uh, you know, on Channel Four, it was like Dylan Moran monster. And honestly, I'd never even heard of him at this point, and. I just we just watched his hour, you know. We must have come in like two, three minutes in or something, and oh, was just howling, you know, like I couldn't believe this guy. He was just he absolutely. Is so good. What's what? What I think's brilliant about him is that he can take a word or a line or a sentence and just run with it. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. you are crying with. He's just creating comedy as he's going along. And Ross yeah. Nuttall is another one who can do that so well. Billy Connolly, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and if you've got that art, it's extraordinary. It really yeah. is. It's so good. It's such a such a good choice. Have you got, yeah. have you got any more? There must be loads. Um, oh, loads. I mean, Bill Bailey, Part Troll. When I saw that, that was incredible. Yeah. You know, Victoria mm. Wood was brilliant. Yeah, I remember yeah, when yeah. Catherine Ryan. You know, when Catherine Ryan, when I saw her on the Apollo, I thought, oh my god, you know. Yeah. Amazing. This woman's incredible. Yeah. Um, so many heroes, really. And whenever anyone asks me this question, I always think I need to write them more down. I mean, I love David O'Doherty. He's my one of my favourites. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. But like present as well. Like you know, one of my favourite acts at the moment is Josh Pugh. I think he's amazing. Oh, he's superb. You know, I think he's absolutely superb. Absolutely yeah. Yeah. He's so um, so he's funny. Incredible. He just keeps topping oh. gags. He's so good. Yeah. My my. Yeah. Um, my first ever gig, first ever show, was with my mum and dad and my brother at Scarborough, and we went to see Les yeah. Dawson in 1974, and he was incredible, wow. just incredible. Yeah, I can imagine. And, then, yeah. and, then, and, and a year later, we saw Tommy Cooper, and then we saw Ken wow. and the two Ronnies, and it just went on and on and on, and I thought... Yeah, yeah. I've got to write all these down. So I've got an enormous yeah. spreadsheet with all every act and every venue I've ever seen. And of course that became That's brilliant. Oh, it, 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 it's it's yeah. it's extraordinary. And um uh um in 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 the eighties when I first came to London, I went to the comedy store and, and on the first bill was um Richard Morton, Phil Jupiter, Linda Smith, Steve Gribbin, and top oh. of the Top of the bill was um, an act called um, Charles Fleischer, who nobody had heard of. He was an, a very visual American comedian. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was never heard of again because he went off to do the voice for Roger Rabbit, for Steven Spielberg. <laughs> no way. Oh, my God. That That's amazing. incredible. <laughs> but, um, but it's just extraordinary watching all these amazing yeah. people like yourself yeah. do do what you do um i've got like, to say just quickly as well just one last one last person that i absolutely yeah, love yeah, it's um Chris, christy kush i don't know if you've seen him he's brilliant i've seen? heard of him he, uh i'm sure oh, i've seen I went him to see, yeah i went to see a show in edinburgh twice and i just i was i was crying you know <laughs> i was just it's so silly it's so silly it's musical it's so absurd it was a, like a breath of oh, yeah, fresh air yeah, I think he's, yeah. and i don't think he gets the, the success he deserves and that's not you know that sounds like like a dig it do, i don't mean that at all i just 
I want everybody to experience his mm -hmm. show because it just oh, it, it's, if you get a chance to go and see it, it's a solo show. I will do go. definitely. I'll, I'll 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 I will make a note of that after this recording. Yeah. Definitely. Um, like me, do you go to a lot of comedy shows as a member of the audience? I do when I can, but the, you know the paradox is that you're always gigging as a as a yeah. comedian. Um, but I do, I do really try and make time for the ones that I want to see. You know, especially kind of either like really top top billing people or you know friends and people that I've wanted to see at Edinburgh. I go and see you know so I go to Soho Theatre whenever I can a lot on Tuesdays when it's sort of like my day off. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I went to see Frank Skinner do a work in progress recently and. That was great. And I saw Dylan Moran do a work in progress. And yeah, often I feel like say I feel like, oh, I've got, you know, Tuesday's my night off. And that's the night that often I'm like, oh, so and so's on at Soho Theatre. I'll go and see that, you know. Um <laughs> well, well so, uh, um, just just yeah. uh, as a as a as a matter of fact, um uh this this the, this podcast is recording in November 22. I am going to yeah. the Soho Theatre tomorrow to see um, Ivo Graham and to see oh. uh, Garrett, Garrett Millerick. So yes. so if you get tickets, I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I saw Ivo's show in Edinburgh. He's brilliant. And it, he's, he's so good. Fantastic. He's incredible. He's, he's a brilliant. He, uh, what a lovely man. I don't, I don't, know, whether oh. you, I don't know whether you've seen... My, I should have wore it tonight. I um, I have a T-shirt that says "Richard says laugh on it," right? Which in you know, because <laughs> he know if you know that he knows I've obviously got a funny laugh. And uh, he 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 got in touch with me at Edinburgh on my phone on through social media, and he yeah. said, yeah, he said, "Are we likely to meet? Can you give me your schedule?" And this went on all week. This was last year. And just yeah. before I left, he presented me with this shirt and I put it on and we had a photograph and everything. And a week later, I saw him play Always Be Comedy and I was wearing the shirt and uh, his entire set was about how he got this shirt for me. He was just wonderful. That's brilliant. Really that. It was extraordinary. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a love, what a, what a genuinely good bloke and a very, very, yeah. Very funny comedian. He's so good. Yeah. He's so good. He's yeah. great. He's a great um, guy. Yeah. Would you, um, if you were on a bill of comedians, would you stay and watch them all if you were on first? Yeah, I often do. Yeah. yeah. Um, unless I have to go somewhere or, you know, sometimes it's just circumstantial where, you know, perhaps you've been gigging for 10 nights in a row or something and you, yeah. you know, you say you, Sometimes you want to go on first and then just go for dinner with your pal or something just to relax a bit. But yeah. but no, generally I'll always I'll always watch people, yeah. Um That's great. because yeah, because I love you know, love comedy. So you and me um, both. Um yeah. How how have you found online gigs? Have you done many of them as opposed to live gigs? And what do you think the future of comedy is? I th I um did quite a few in lockdown actually yeah and I think I I'm really glad that I did them because I think it kept my momentum up um and when I sort of just basically hit the ground running as soon as lockdown was lifted you know um I think it's it's not I don't think it's a good medium for comedy um for stand up comedy um I had a few people that did a gig did gigs with me where they did which they don't do on stage. They almost did like a character for the Zoom, which I think mm. works really well um, because it's more of a set piece. Uh, I think comedy's too reliant on like being there in person and um, the atmosphere and the the connection between you know the audience and the and the comedian. However, what I will say is I do a, I host a gig every month for Dulwich Hamlet Football Club. Um, which is fantastic. In fact, Ivo Graham's headlining the December one, which is always all for charity. And um, we did one, you know, we it was very early. We were the, one of the first people, I think, to sort of say, oh, well, let's do a Zoom gig. And I, honestly, I was so sceptical. I thought, oh, this is going to be, <laughs> you know, and I was hosting it online. I, I, but it, it was because the people that run it, um, Matt Arnold, who's fantastic, yeah. he's a, he's a tv producer and he realized that there needed to be you know 
certain audience unmuted and kind of certain rules but the ones that were unmuted had to know not to chat and that sort of thing and we had they had they made a proper sort of like tv intro for it you know they we had um Badil and Skinner it'll never work as the as wow. the opening <laughs> didn't know what we were doing you know and I had a backdrop up here I still got the nails like um nailed in behind me here because I used to put up a, a fluorescent pink background just to make it a bit showy you know <laughs> um and uh, they were brilliant because they were well done. And we had like a thousand people on the first one. It was mental because I think we just, those first few were so popular because they they were at that time period where people were really, you know, craving social contact. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously it wasn't in person, but it was live and it felt sort of connected. So, yeah, my, it was. Um, my, my view is that um, during lockdown, uh, thank God they were there, but I, but I, I, I totally agree with you because when when they first started, I I used to go to the Always Be Comedy one. I'd go to the Happy Mondays with Sean James, and I'd yeah. go to uh, the Irish one with um, Charlotte Regan on a Friday. When they were done yeah. well, they were brilliant. But when they first started, there was no audio, so I would just yeah. sit there laughing at four walls, and I thought it was going to be taken away because nobody could hear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but once they got the audio in, really nice. they could do the timing and they could chat to the audience. But I'm a hundred percent with you. You you cannot beat um, going out for dinner, having a few beers, and then going to a comedy show, yeah. sitting down because it's yeah. all the moment, and and you're sitting there yeah. and you're thinking, right, make me laugh, and and you exactly. always. But every, everywhere I go, uh, I I just love it. I, I I really do. Yeah, I've 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 so much enjoyed talking to you. You've been a fantastic guest, and I wish you so much success. Um, oh, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you for being such a you know a supporter of the industry. It's it's so nice. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, is there is there anything else you would like to say before we go? Where, where can people find you on social media? Have you got any podcasts? Are, are you doing any writing? Uh, yeah, you know what? If you, if you just if you follow me, uh, I'm at Alexandra Haddo on Instagram, um, and I've got a link tree, which is so handy. It's just a little website, like with all the, you know, I sort of update it quite regularly with what gigs I've got coming up. So that's probably the easiest way um, to. You know, or if you like, literally, I, I never mind if, you know, some people, they follow me on Twitter or something and they'll say, oh, I'm in town this week. Are you getting anywhere? I'll always just, you know, let people know. So just drop me a message if you ever want to come and see me, basically. Well, please do. because Please do continue because I'm going to be in the front row very, very soon watching you again. I thought, as I say, I thought I thought your performance at 21 Soho was outstanding. You were absolutely Oh, thank you hilarious. so much. I remember I that gig. It was great. Actually. It was I, a great time. Uh, you yeah. were so so good that night, uh, and I will I will come and see you very very soon. Thank you oh, so. Oh please much. do. Let's get a beer. Afterwards. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so so much for your time, and all Thanks. the very best to you. Thank you, Richard. Cheers. Thanks. Now, bye bye.